Well, good morning, Garden Church. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you around God's Word. If you have a copy of God's Word, I would love for you to grab it and join me in Acts chapter 1. We're going to start in Acts. We'll make our way to 2 Timothy and then to Matthew and then we'll end up in Luke. So we're going to be bouncing around a little bit this morning, but we'd love for you to have a copy of God's Word in your lap. Acts chapter 1. We are in the middle of a six-week sermon series that we've entitled The Persistent Disciple, uh, looking at what are some markers, what are some identifiers of true and genuine disciples of Christ. For those of us who have professed genuine faith in Christ, what does it look like? How ought we to live? And so we have been challenging you. We started with uh, that you ought to persist in the Word persist in the word. That's, that, that was our umbrella sermon, if you will. And then we looked at persisting and standing firm, standing firm in the truth in the midst of a culture and a world that is spinning out of control. And last week, we looked at persisting in the midst of suffering. And so this morning, the title of my sermon is Persist in Multiplication. Persist in Multiplication. Uh, multiplying yourself as a disciple of Jesus and so I thought about naming this Persist in Discipleship, which would be similar, right? We, we know that we have a great commission to go there for and make disciples. We are to be about discipleship. Uh, but the word discipleship is, well, first of all, it's not found anywhere in the Bible. Obviously, the word disciple is all over. Discipleship is not. And honestly, the word discipleship is a little bit nebulous, right? Like, what does that mean? And everybody kind of has their own idea of what discipleship is and what it should be. And different churches have their own discipleship models, discipleship strategies, as they should. What I would say is that any biblical church should have biblical discipleship. We should be about making disciples. But every church says, well, th this is the way to do it. This is the way. And the Bible doesn't exactly say this is how you make a disciple. And so what you end up with is a bunch of churches that have their own uh, models, their own strategies, uh, churches that would say, Here, here's our discipleship ladder. And so you started this rung and then you go to this rung and then you take this class or you, you sit through this lecture and then you go to this rung. Uh, a, a popular church in California, I believe it was, that popularized the idea of a discipleship uh, baseball diamond where you move to first base and then you go to second base and then you do something and you end up at third base and the goal is to arrive back home. And, and honestly, the, the problem that I have with those kind of models is that it assumes that there is a finish line, right? You, what happens when you get to the top rung of the ladder? What happens when you come back home? Are you now like a you know, graduate disciple student? And what I would say is that discipleship has no end point that we continue to grow in discipleship for the rest of our lives. And so well, what I would say is may, maybe a good way to look at discipleship is to think about a target with a bullseye in the middle. And the bullseye is Jesus. And so we're all at different points around the target. Some of us may be a little bit closer to Jesus, depending on how long we've been serving Jesus, how long we've been following Jesus. But, but here's what's interesting about this analogy is that the closer you move to the bullseye, then you zoom in a little bit and you realize how far you are from the bullseye, that there's still more work to do. There's still more of Jesus to understand. There's more truth to dive into the depths of. But that is discipleship. It is simply moving closer to Jesus and, and helping other people move closer to Jesus. What I would say is that this is the strategy that God and in His infinite eternal, omniscient wisdom employed. This was his strategy to expand his kingdom. He has chosen you, Christian. He's chosen you to tell other people about Jesus and to help them grow in their devotion to Jesus. And that's wild, right? Like, if you think about it, like, that's crazy. Why in the world would God choose me? Why would he choose you? Like, this is, you know, this is God Almighty. He could have done whatever he wanted to expand his kingdom. He could have played Holy Spirit, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. you're in. He, he, could have, he could have dropped, you know, truth serum bombs from heaven on different people to, to quicken their spirits, to help them understand and to regenerate them, to justify them. But he's chosen you. He's chosen to use you, Christian, to expand his kingdom. But here's what we need to understand, is that it's not simply little old you that has this extraordinary job of, of making disciples and, and being his witnesses to the ends of the earth. It's the Spirit of the living God within you. 
that gives you power, that equips you. And so let me remind you of what happened in the book of Acts after Jesus' uh, death and burial and resurrection. He, he was talking to his disciples before his ascension, and he told them in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. He actually didn't tell them. He ordered them, is what it says. It says, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then skip down to verse 8. This is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to look like. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus just starts levitating. Right? Like he's gone. He, he, he's gone. And the, the disciples are standing there looking at each other like, first of all, what was that? And secondly, that's a tall order. Like, he just told us, the 11 of us, like, we're going to have to find another 12th, right? We'll get Matthias. But he just told us that we're going to be the ones who spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. How in the world are we going to do that? Like, that, that, that's a big order. we got to go, fellas. There's a lot of work to do. And, and one of them, I imagine, is like, no, 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 no. You remember what he said? He said, don't do anything. Don't move until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Don't do anything until you've been indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you are going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then look what happens with the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? If you want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a few verses in the first few chapters of Acts. If you want to try to follow along, we'll be going rapid fire. But look at Acts chapter 1, verse 15. It says, In those days there was about 120 disciples. All right? So there's 120 Christians at this point. And then flip over to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts 2, 41 says, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added, consider that word added, circle that word, there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And then look at a few verses later, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. It says, the Lord added, there's that word again, the Lord added to their number day by day. And then look at Acts chapter 4, verse 4. It says, many more believed which added up to 5,000, all right? Now there's 5,000 Christians. Flip over to Acts chapter 5. Look at verse 14. Acts 5, 14. And more than ever, believers were added, here we go, were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And then finally, look at Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Acts 6, 7. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Multiplied. Do you see that? Do you see what just happened there? We went from addition to multiplication. Like this is exponential growth. This is what happens when you have the power of the Holy Spirit working in you in order to work through you. And then a couple chapters later, we're introduced to a guy named Saul who is just ravaging the church. He hates Christians. He's oppressing Christians. He's persecuting Christians. He's killing Christians. But what Saul doesn't know is that his hatred for God is no match for the power of the Spirit of God. And so Saul gets radically saved. And instead of being the hater, he becomes the hated. Instead of being the oppressor, he becomes the oppressed. He suffers greatly for the sake of Christ and for the kingdom of God. And he goes on to write half of the books of the New Testament. And the very last book that he writes is a letter to a young pastor named Timothy. 2 Timothy. Go ahead and flip over to 2 Timothy with me. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And when you're there, why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word. 2 Timothy 2, we're going to look at the first seven verses. Paul says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. This is the sermon from last week, right? Persist in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. 
It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And so, Father God, we ask that you would give us understanding in everything as we consider the truth of your word. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would, even now, that you would till up the, the soil of our hearts, that your, land, that your word would land on good soil, and that it would take root, and that it would bear much fruit for your name's sake. Would you do this in us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so this is Paul's final exhortation to Timothy, and essentially Paul's final exhortation to us. He says, persist in multiplication. Persist in multiplication. What he says in chapter 1, verse 14, he tells Timothy to guard the good deposit that has been entrusted to him. Guard the good deposit that's been entrusted to him. What does that mean? Like some would think, well, it must be that this is Paul. He, he's never been married. He doesn't have any kids. He's starting to get old and gray, and he's thinking he might die. So he gives his inheritance to Timothy, who is kind of his son in the faith. And he says, guard the good deposit that I'm entrusting to you. That's not it. It has nothing to do with inheritance at all. The good deposit is the truth of the gospel. It's the gospel message. The, the, the truth that Timothy heard from, this is chapter 1, Lois, his grandmother, and Eunice, his mother, and obviously from Paul, his spiritual father, his mentor. Paul has been discipling Timothy, and before Paul dies, he wants to make it crystal clear that this good deposit is not to terminate on Timothy, but is to flow through Timothy. Timothy is to be a conduit of the gospel. He's to be a conduit of the good deposit and is, don't miss this, in verse 2, he is to entrust this good deposit to other faithful men who will in turn teach others also. Did you see that? What we have here is four levels of discipleship. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, faithful men to others. This is multiplication. This is disciple. Like this, this is God's plan. It's crazy, right? This, this is the best pyramid scheme ever. Except it's not illegal. This is God's design that that what He has entrusted to you, that it would not terminate on you, but that you would share it with others. This is not just for Timothy. This is for you as well, Christian. This is what we see in the Great Commission, right? That Jesus promises to be with you, and He promises to to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul says the same thing here in chapter 2, verse 1 to Timothy. You will receive strength by the grace of Christ Jesus. You'll receive strength for the mission to which you are being called. And this is, this is the confidence that we should have. Right, that we don't just have to muster up some kind of strength. Like, man, this is a this is a big task. I guess we got to go. I guess I got to be strong. No, you're strong through the strength of God within you, through the ghost that God gives you to lead you, to comfort you, to equip you. The task is great, but let me remind you, church. This is a command. Okay, this is a command for every single one of us. This is a commission, right? The great commission, famous last words. The, the last thing that Jesus says before he leaves this earth. He said a lot, he's like, look, I've said a lot of things over the last three years. If I could leave you with one thing, just one thing at all, go therefore and make disciples. This is the great commission. It is not the great suggestion. And listen, I say that because a lot of us in here, if we're honest, we're like, I don't know. I mean, I know I'm part of the body of Christ and we all, you know, we all have our own roles, but, but that's not me, right? Like someone else can do the discipling. I'm not, I, I'm not gifted in evangelism. Well, you might not have the gift of evangelism, but you have the command of evangelism. I don't usually steal other pastors' anecdotes, but here we go. Actually, I heard, I heard this uh, several years ago, and it, it stuck with me. One pastor said this, Some Christians are better at obeying Simon than they are at obeying Jesus. And he's not talking about Simon Peter. He's talking about Simon Says. You guys remember the, 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 the children's game, right? Simon Says, touch your nose. 
Simon says, rub your head. Like you do what, it's easy. Whatever Simon says, you do it. But when Jesus tells you to do something, we memorize it. Anyone? Right? Like, oh, that's good, Jesus. Man, that, that, that's really good. I need to, you know, I, I, I'm going to remember that. And she's like, I didn't tell you to memorize. I told you to do it. Right? Like the anecdote goes on. Like if I told my daughter, hey, go clean your bedroom. And uh, she leaves. And then she comes back 30 minutes later. And she's like, hey, dad, I memorized what you said. You said, go clean your bedroom. I got it. Go clean your bedroom. And I honestly, I've been thinking a lot about it. Even too, right? Even the word go, God, dad, I was thinking, is that like... I should go, or is it as I go? And so I've just kind of been thinking, like, what exactly does that mean? And I called some friends, and we're going to get together later this afternoon, and we're all going to, you know, discuss, like, what it would look like if I actually clean my room. And I'm like, I, I told you to go clean your room. Just do it. Just obey. And here we are. This is what we do with the Great Commission. Right? Like, oh, that, that's, that's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember that, Jesus. And we do, right? The, like, Matthew chapter 28. Um, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And, and behold, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Boom. Got it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Gold star, blue ribbon. Who cares if you memorize it? This is a command to be obeyed. Every Christian should be trying to help non-Christians become Christians. And every Christian should be trying to help other Christians become stronger in their faith. And every Christian should be trying to position themselves to become stronger in their own faith. This is discipleship. And it's really, it's really not that radical of an idea. Discipleship is simply living the Christian life the way that the Christian life was intended to be lived. But yet, we've kind of hijacked biblical Christianity and swapped it out for 21st century Christianity, which is a lot more soft. We try to make it palatable, right? So that it's really not that, it doesn't really require anything. It's just, you know, come on, you, you want to be a good person also? You, you love Jesus, right? Come on, come to church. You're, you're, you're a Christian, And we've replaced like the, the hard teachings of Jesus with this easy believism and it's creating false converts and the Lord is not pleased. L let me give you those three again. Every Christian should be trying to help non-Christians become Christians. And every Christian should be trying to help other Christians grow in their faith. And every Christian should be trying to position themselves to grow in their own faith. And so let's talk about those three. And let's start with the last one, to grow in your own faith. You need to become stronger in your faith, Christian, regardless of who you are. You need to become stronger. I need to become stronger in my faith. Well, like, think about it. If the goal is multiplication, to duplicate yourself, you got to ask the question, do we really want two of you? Like, do we really, is, that a, is that a win? Do we really want another one of you wandering around the church, around this earth? Those of you that are parents that have kids, there's nothing more exciting and more terrifying than seeing your kids emulate you. Right? And I'll give you an example even from this past week. And I'm going to put my son back there on, on, on the spotlight. because So this past week, he, he goes to, to school here, and they had a chapel service. And the chapel speaker was talking about something. And as he was speaking, Mason was kind of like, I don't that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound biblical. Um, and so he's kind of trying to think what the guy's saying and, and understand it rightly. And after chapel, he went up and talked to the guy. Um, and then his Bible teacher came over and they were talking and then like six other students came over and, and they ended up talking, he said, for like 45 minutes. Like they skipped the next class. All right, which that, I'm not saying that's, that's a reflection of me because I didn't do that. <laughs> but um, he, he texted me the class after that. And he's like, Dad, you got, you got time for a theology question? 
I'm like, yeah, bring it. I love that, right? And he's like, I I'm not going to tell you what I think, but what are your thoughts on this? And I'm like, well, this is my thoughts because I think this is what the Bible says. He's like, okay, cool. That's what I, that's what I thought too. And he went on to tell me the whole story. And honestly, I was proud, man. I'm like, that's cool that, that you're, you're listening to this guy who's speaking with authority, but you're not just accepting everything. You're, you're Berean about it. You're, you're holding it up to scripture. And I remember Carrie came home and she heard the story. She's like, you might grow up to be a preacher like your daddy. <laughs> and Mason's like, I don't think so. And I'm like, well, I didn't think so either. So be careful. You never know what God's going to do. Right? So in that moment, I'm like, man, you know, it's, it, but, but not so he doesn't get a big head back there because there's also plenty of times where I'm like, son, what are you doing? Like, wh wh what is this? Where in the, where did you learn that? And then I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> Don't answer that question. Just go to your room. <laughs> as we think about discipleship, as we think about multiplication, we have to look inward before we look outward. We have to look upward to see what God would, would say and what would have us do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. We have to get serious about our holiness church. The way that you live matters. Are you a reflection of Christ? Are you growing to look more like Christ? Well, let me give you guys a Bible verse. For those of you that are asking the question that all of us have asked at one point in our lives, but maybe you're in the season right now where you're just wondering, what is God's will for my life? Like, man, I wish God would just show me what his will was for me. Like, what, what, is, what do you have for me, God? What is your will for my life? I'm going to tell you, Bible's going to tell you. You ready? 1 Thessalonians 4.3. This is going to blow your mind. Here you go. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. There you go. What does God want for you? He wants you to grow to become more like Jesus. He wants you to move closer to the bullseye. He wants you to trust God more, to love God more, to obey God more, to be discipled. And so I ask you this morning, church, are you being discipled? And again, I know that sounds, or that could be a bit nebulous. What exactly does it, and, and even when I say, are you being discipled, maybe some of you guys get a picture of like going out to coffee every Tuesday with someone that's older than you and just listening to them and gleaning from their wisdom and, and, and understanding their advice. And I would say that certainly can be one form of Discipleship. That, that's the Titus 2 discipleship. Older women should teach younger women. And likewise, older men should train and encourage younger men. But discipleship can look very different. It's not just a cookie cutter thing, right? How are you being discipled? And some people ask me as a pastor, hey, what is the discipleship model of the Garden Church? And I say, well, I mean, we got community groups. We got men's breakfast on the first Saturday of every month. Uh, the women are doing, I don't even know what they're doing, but they're getting together Saturday. They're doing a women's tea. We're actually having, and this is hot off the press, ladies, there's, we're, we're going to do a women's study. Well, not we. You're going to do a women's study in January. Uh, we have youth group. Uh, we, we've done an equipping class. We'll have other classes to, to equip you in different ways. But what do all those things have in common? All those things have in common is that the Word of God is being taught. Your kids right now are being discipled in the back in those three classes. Why? Because the Word of God is being taught. And to try to disciple someone without using the Word of God is like trying to teach someone to fish without using a fishing pole. It doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? But let me tell you this, church. The number one discipleship strategy at the Garden Church is happening right now. And it happens every single Sunday right about this time when myself or somebody else gets up behind this pulpit and opens up the Word of God and proclaims the truth of the Word of God. And so, so many of you are encouraging with your feedback. Um, hey, good, good sermon, Pastor. Uh, thank you for laboring in the word, pastor. Um, home run, pastor, every once in a while, right? Broken clock is right twice a day, pastor. <laughs> and I, I do, I appreciate that, I really do. But listen, the goal of sitting 
underneath the preaching of the word is that the word of God would dwell in you richly, so richly that it would change you, that you would be changed. The goal is not to be convicted. The goal is not to get teary-eyed. The goal is not to have a full page of notes. The goal is not to have a good conversation in the car on the way home. What do you think about church? What do you think about that sermon? Those are all good and well, but if it doesn't lead to change, then it's all for naught. When you hear the truth of the Word of God preached, when you study the Word of God for yourself, you ought to walk away asking, what must I do now in response to the truth of the Word of God? What needs to change in my life? How can I grow to become more like Jesus? How can I be transformed more into the image of Christ? That's how you are discipled, by approaching God's Word in that way. That's how you move closer to the bullseye. And so we are disciples. We are disciples who make other disciples. And so flip with me to your left to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, this is the account of the very first disciples that Jesus calls. I'm going to read Matthew 4, starting in verse 18. It says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The very first disciples right here on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus says, follow me, be my disciples. And as my disciple, your life is going to radically change. Instead of catching fish, you are going to be catching people. Instead of mending your nets, verse 21, you are going to be mending broken hearts. This is a radical call. And even just as radical, they obeyed. They followed. It says immediately. It says that word twice. Immediately they followed. And so I want to give you four markers of genuine Christ followers from this little passage in Matthew chapter 4. Four markers of genuine Christ followers. Number one, followers of Christ are willing to leave everything behind. Followers of Christ are willing to leave everything behind. We, we saw there that they, they left their nets. We saw they left their boat. We see they left their father See, a decision to follow Christ is not a decision to add another item to your list of hobbies or interests. A decision to follow Christ is a trump card over every other hobby and interest in your life. It is a complete shakeup, a complete reorganization, a complete restructuring of every area of your life to make them subjected to your new identity as a Christ follower. Followers of Christ are willing to leave everything behind, including themselves. That's what Jesus said, right? If anyone wants to be my disciple, he must what? Deny himself. Deny himself. So that the follower of Christ would say, this is no longer about me. This is no longer about the plans that I have for myself. This is no longer about my dreams and my goals and my aspirations and my desires. This is about Jesus and his kingdom. Number two, followers of Christ don't always know where they're going, but they always know who they're with. <coughs> followers of Christ don't always know where they're going, but they know who they're with, and that's enough. That's enough. Like you imagine James and John are leaving their father in verse 22 in the boat, and you have to imagine Zebedee's like, what are you doing? Where are you guys going? What, what, is, what is happening? Where, where are you going? And they're like, we don't know, Dad. Well, what are you going to do? Well, we're going fishing, I guess. Fishing for people. Well, what does that mean? We don't know, Dad. Well, when are you going to be back? We don't know, Dad. Well, what do you know? We're going to be with Jesus. We're going to be with Jesus. Number three, followers of Christ go fishing. 
This is simple, but, but don't miss this. Followers of Christ go fishing. They understand the assignment. Jesus did not say, follow me and I'll give you the best rabbinical education that you can imagine. Jesus did not say, follow me and I'll make you part of the best community of people that you've ever known. Jesus did not say, follow me and I'll give you free health care. Don't have to worry about sickness or disease anymore. No, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so if we follow that logically, it begs the question, if you are not fishing for men, then are you really following Jesus? When was the last time that you talked to an unbeliever about Jesus? When was the last time that you shared the gospel with someone? And look, I know you're busy. I get it, right? Like this, this life is, there's a lot going on. There's, there's responsibilities and there's obligations and there's deadlines and there's opportunities, right? Good things that we want to enter into this and go here and, and do this with these people. But I, I just want us to zoom out a little bit and to consider and have a greater perspective on eternity. Like you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? And you're going to say, because I trusted in you, Jesus. Because I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that there's no way that I could clean myself up. I know that I need a perfect substitute, a perfect sacrifice. And I trusted you, Jesus, to be that perfect sacrifice. The work that you did on Calvary was enough. You said it is finished. And I believed you. I trusted you. And Jesus is going to say, Amen. Come on in. All right? There's nothing else. That you, to, to be saved, you repent and you believe. There's nothing else to it. But I just wonder, you know, Jesus puts his arm around you and you guys are walking to your room or to your mansion. And Jesus is like, so... How'd it go down there? What, what, uh, what did you do with what I entrusted to you? You're like, what do you mean? Well, you, you know, the good deposit that I, that, I, that I entrusted to you to guard. What'd you do with it? The gospel. You'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I trust, I believed it, right? Yeah, I know, you already said that. That's why you're here. But, but what else? What'd you do with it? Well, God, if I'm honest, I was busy. God, I mean, you know that. You know all things, right? Like, there's a lot going on down there. And I mean, I tried to live a good life and when opportunities came up, but I didn't really go out of my way. I just, but, and listen, I don't think there's going to be any shame in heaven, but I, I wonder if there's going to be regret that we're like, man, we could have joined in this crazy mission that, that Jesus has invited us into and we just kind of punted on it. I know this life is busy. And it could be a really busy year for you. But a busy year could turn into a busy 80 years. Don't lose focus of what it is that you're doing here. You are on mission, church. Number four, followers of Christ understand the cost of following Christ. Followers of Christ understand the cost of following Christ and they aren't afraid to tell other people about the cost. I feel like, I feel like a lot of Christian evangelism today has become so watered down that it is, it is incomplete at best and heresy at worst. It's almost like Christian evangelism sounds eerily similar to a sales pitch for a destination vacation at Sandals Resort. Are you tired? Are you tired of being tired? Have you tried everything and you still feel sad and lonely? Try Jesus. Jesus is awesome. Jesus will make you happy. And you get to go to heaven. Heaven's awesome. Our approach is all wrong. We feel like we need to convince people of what Jesus can do for them instead of convincing them that they are in desperate need of Jesus. Instead of showing them their sin and the wages of their sin and what happens if their sin is not forgiven. Flip over to Luke chapter 14. We're going to end our time in Luke. Luke 14. And 
Jesus' model of evangelism was so different from what we see in a lot of churches today. The goal of a lot of churches is just to get a crowd, right? Get as many people as we can and then keep them by telling them how great their life can be with Jesus and, and itching their ears. Try to talk them into becoming a Christian. But Jesus actually does the opposite. Jesus tries to talk people out of becoming a Christian. It's true. I'm going to show you. Why? Why in the world would he do that? Because if Jesus was unable to talk them out of becoming a Christian, out of becoming a disciple of his, then he knew that they would likely remain. Then he knew that their faith was likely genuine. See, Jesus is not interested in large crowds following him around for the sake of it appearing that he's someone special or him being popular. Jesus is not interested in crowds because Jesus is not interested in false converts. And so look at how Jesus spoke to the crowds in Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. It says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's not what we hear from a lot of churches today. Right? Most, most churches would preach this passage. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and he said to them, if anyone wants to invite me into their heart, I'll give you your best life now. And Jesus is like, no, you need, to, you need to hate everything and everyone else, even yourself, in comparison to the affections that you have for me. That's the kind of devotion that, that is required to be a disciple. A true disciple of mine will bear his own cross. What does that mean? We, we don't really use that language in our vernacular today to bear your own cross, but Jesus' listeners would have known exactly what he was talking about because when a Roman soldier busts into someone's house and drags him out and puts a cross on his back and leads him away, everybody knew what was going on. That guy had a one-way ticket for death. And this is the language that Jesus uses. This is not an invitation for prosperity. This is an invitation to figuratively die to yourself and quite possibly, literally, die for your faith. Look at verse 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Followers of Christ understand the cost and they aren't afraid to tell other people about the cost, to tell them the truth of what is required in following Jesus. Look at verse 33. I don't think I have it on the screen, but Jesus says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Like, it's just, we, we don't... Well, we don't consider the words of Jesus. Like, we want to water this day. He didn't really mean that. Well, what did he mean? It's right here in red. And then Jesus kind of ends his sermon in a weird way in verse 34. I don't know if I put this on the screen or not, but look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 14, verse 34. All right, after Jesus is talking about hating your family and taking up your cross and building a tower, and going to war. He starts talking about salt. He says, Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Do you have ears to hear, church? What is this? What are, you, what are you talking about salt all of a sudden? And it's not the first time Jesus talked about salt. He did it on the Sermon on the Mount as well, right? You are the salt of the earth, Christian. We are to be salty. We are to be uh, agents of, of preservation. We preserve what is good and well and true in, in this culture of decay. We are to be agents of healing like salt is. We are to add flavor, if you will, by, by applying the salve of the gospel to a lost and dying world. 
And here Jesus is saying, if salt has lost its saltiness, in other words, it looks like salt, but it's really not salt. And there's a lot of people who think they're disciples, and they go to church, and they memorize some passages, and they sing the songs, and they walk like a duck and quack like a duck, but they're not a disciple. They're not genuinely converted. And this is what Jesus is warning against, is false converts. He says that kind of salt is good for nothing. He's like, don't even throw it on the dirt. You're going to ruin some good dirt. Don't even throw it on the, on the manure. Right? It's right here. Like you're going to ruin a perfectly good pile of poo by adding these kind of people who think that they're disciples. And they're not. Jesus is so adamant about making sure that people who claim to be Christians are actually genuinely converted and following him. Matthew 7 is clear. There's a lot of, there's many people who think that they will end up in heaven and they will end up in hell. And so, it's an opportunity to examine yourself and it's an opportunity to get serious about spreading seed, about casting the seed, about going fishing. We live in the midst of a lost and hurting and dying world and eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. Every single soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. Luke chapter 5, this will be the last passage. We already looked at Matthew's account. I want you to see Luke's account of Jesus calling the first disciples. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 4. So Jesus is on Simon and Andrew's boat. He's pushed out from the shore a little bit and he's teaching and the crowds on the shore. And then when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners, James and John, and the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they both began to sink. This is crazy. Jesus is in the boat. And he's like, hey, throw your nets over here. And Peter's like, look, I know you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman been doing this all night. They're just not buying tonight, Jesus. But, but, at your word, I'll let down the nets. I'll go ahead and be obedient because I trust you. And look what happens. And the God that caused all these fish to swim into the nets of the disciples 2,000 years ago is the same God that will cause men and women to come to faith to respond to your evangelistic efforts. It's not you that's doing it. It's God that's doing it. You don't have to be the most polished presenter. You don't have to be the most convincing, charismatic speaker. You don't have to be able to answer all of their questions. You simply have to go fishing. You simply have to be obedient. You simply have to say, hey, I, I trust you. I don't know how you can use someone like me, but I understand that this is the command. Therefore, I will be obedient. And see what the Lord might do through you to engage in this kind of mission this glorious, eternal, grand mission to, to rescue and to redeem mankind he's invited you into, church. That should blow your mind if you understand your sinfulness and your brokenness. But do you trust the Lord enough to say, I'm in. Let's go. Let's go fishing. Let's see what the Lord might do through our obedience. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we do, we do confess that we, we feel inadequate 
and the the mission the commission is so great it's overwhelming there's 3.2 billion people on this globe that have never heard the name of Jesus and you've asked us you've invited us and you've commanded us to enter into that and so father would you give us a, a posture of humility where we know that it's not us that's going to save anybody it's simply that the power is in the gospel the gospel is the power of god unto salvation for all who believe and so lord would you give us confidence boldness courage to step out and to open our mouths and to trust that you might do a mighty work through your servants. God, blow us away by glorifying yourself in this way. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.